Let us worship our God together and exhort one another as we sing from the Trinity hymnal, hymn number 493. Who is on the Lord's side? 493, let's stand as we sing. Let us pray. O Lord, our God, we have just affirmed to thee a bold affirmation that we are on the Lord's side. May it be so, O Father, and may our lives manifest that declaration 
so that we are not simply those who speak the language, but those who live the truth. And may our gathering this evening be anointed from on high to aid us in that self-examination and in that living unto the truth. We give thanks that we are assembled here at the close of the Lord's day. We rejoice in our Savior who sanctified this day and hallowed it by his resurrection thereon. And we pray, O Lord, that this evening our own hearts and lives might be sanctified and hallowed anew unto his service, his kingdom, and his glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated, and good evening and welcome. It is a joy indeed to welcome you to the Lord's house this evening and to be together with you to look in the word and hear God's truth once again. Many of our people are away uh, at camp, as we mentioned this morning. Uh, I know the Russells this evening are taking their two daughters up to the Free Presbyterian camp because there was a little health issue in the kindergarten building at the end, uh, last day of day camp. And uh, some are just now recuperating from that, and so their departure last night was delayed. So uh, they're uh, on the way as well. Uh, plus, it is summer, isn't it? And that's the time for many people to be about uh, in travels. But I'm glad that you're here, and it's wonderful to be together with you, and we thank God for everyone that he has brought together this evening. Since Mike is out, I'm reading the scripture, and in your bulletin we have Psalm number 15 as the scripture reading, but I want to expand it to include Psalm number 14 as well. <clears throat> so if you will open your Bibles to the book of Psalms, Psalm 14 and 15, we will read together. And the reason I've expanded to include Psalm number 14 it's because it appears that these two psalms, in fact, if I may preach a little bit of the introduction to the message here and now, that these two psalms, in fact, are placed in this sequence in order to provide a contrast. Psalm number 14, you will see the description of the wicked man and the wickedness of man. Psalm 15, which will be our focus this evening, a description of the upright man, the godly man, the man of truth. Thus we proceed to the reading of God's holy word. May we hear his voice, for this is the word of God. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works, there is none that doeth good. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge? who eat up my people as they eat bread and call not upon the Lord? There were they in great fear, for God is in the generation of the righteous. Ye have shamed the counsel of the poor, because the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that the salvation of Israel were come out of Zion, when the Lord bringeth back the captivity of his people, Jacob shall rejoice, and Israel shall be glad. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly, and worketh righteousness, and speaketh the truth in his heart, he that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor, in whose eyes a vile person is contemned, 
but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his own hurt, and changeth not. He that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent. He that doeth these things shall never be moved. Amen. This is the word of God. There is a handout that was prepared for this evening. If you got it coming in, great. If you would like to have a copy, um, simply um, let it be known, and perhaps during the announcements and into the next hymn, if need be, uh, they can be made available to you. Uh, It's simply a reproduction of the 15th Psalm with a little bit of the numbering of the sequence of these instructions uh, to try to help us through the psalm this evening. So uh, let it be known if you need one, they are available to be distributed at this time. Just to review some calendar items for our church family, as Pastor has already referenced, do be thinking about our young people and Miles and Lois Carper, along with Andrea Ellen Peters, who are with our 15 young people up at the Free Presbyterian Youth Camp this week. Miles Carper communicated to me this morning that the theme of the week for them is the truth. And may we pray that God would indeed stamp truth upon the hearts of these young people. And uh, may may that allow you to inform your prayers as well as you pray for the young people that they will be impressed with what is true in our world. And of course, there's one absolute truth in God's word before us. May our young people embrace that by God's spirit. I uh, had the occasion over the weekend to kind of make my north of the Mason-Dixon line circuit up through Shrewsbury and Red Lion and that area. And I noted like every school that I passed had a big yellow bus parked in front of it with a big sign on it. You know what the sign said? Bus drivers need it. Uh, we, are you ready to come back, Mrs. Decker? We'll pull, pull you back from retirement. Um, we don't have a big yellow bus with that sign on it, but I can speak for Carl Myers, our director of transportation, when I say we would love to add to our number of drivers. And a, a bus driving license requires some bit of training, which we pick up that expense and we will kind of shepherd you through that process. But we also have need for van drivers, which uh, are, are 14, 15 passenger vans that do not require holding a CDL to drive them. But uh, if you or if you or anyone you know would be interested in making this part of your ministry for the school, please let us know. Please spread the word that along with every public school under the sun, Hartford Christian's looking for bus drivers as well. And uh, we will pick up the expense and remunerate your efforts as a driver. Um, We hope you'll consider that and extend that word to those around you. We do have an event at the end of this month in your bulletin. It's our ladies um, Bible study on the 31st, the last day of the month on Saturday at nine o'clock and that's scheduled to be in the high school library area. And then we want to keep in mind the very last camp of the summer for our ministry here will be a STEM camp in the morning followed by volleyball camp in the afternoon. That may be reversed, but both of those camps in the early part of August. Do remember um, Roger and Susie Williams in prayer as they lead um, a tremendous effort this summer in having our campus ready for 100 additional students, taking us up near 400 students for the coming year, God helping. Uh, Do be praying for them. Uh, And also for the arrival, as Ruth Edwards has mentioned in one of our evening prayer services, just the arrival of all of the equipment needs that come with this additional influx of students. So we'd appreciate you remember Hartford Hartford Christian School as you pray daily. And then do keep on your family calendars, August the 14th, which is our next uh, church fellowship opportunity. Uh, which are annual church picnic. I believe the group from Malvern will be joining us as well, but do keep that on your family calendars. Let's sing together once again from the Trinity hymnal, hymn number 446, a paraphrase from the first psalm, hymn 446. Let's stand as we sing.
Please be seated. What solemn words are brought to our heart in the singing of that first psalm. Will you turn with me once again to Psalm number 15, where we will consider this psalm of David and must acknowledge uh, upon embarking upon this psalm that while we know it is a psalm of David thus affirmed in the title, we do not know exactly when this was written or what the occasion was that prompted David in the writing of this psalm. However, we do know enough from David's life, the sequence and experiences that he lived through, to make what I think to be a good estimate of the occasion upon which this psalm was composed. The psalm is asking, who is suitable to stand before God, specifically in his holy hill, in his tabernacle? David, we know, was very concerned about a dwelling place for God. We know that he wanted to build the temple in Jerusalem and was not permitted to, God affirming that the heaven of heavens couldn't contain him. But David did take great pains to endeavor to see to it that the sacred things of God, items from the tabernacle, were in their proper place. And so we will recall the event in which David <coughs> was having the Ark of the Covenant moved, transported on an ox cart. And as it was being moved, the oxen went across a threshing floor that was rather rough, and the ark upon the cart began to shake and rattle, and there was the fear that it might even drop off of the cart to the ground. And so one of the ones who was obviously an attendant in the moving of that ark, Uzzah, reached out his hand to stable and steady the ark, and he was immediately smitten dead. The ark was a sacred object of the tabernacle. Above it was the dwelling place of Jehovah among his people. It was to be moved only by one means, that being the Levites bearing it on poles between their shoulders, four men carrying it. And with the death of Uzzah, there was a smiting of the entire nation, as well as David's will to move the ark. Later, the ark would be moved acceptably. But between the first effort at moving and the second, we can imagine David thinking to himself, how is God to be served? Who can stand before him? The holy hill upon which his ark is to be enshrined. Who can ascend thereunto? The tent in which his ark is tabernacled. Who can stand there? And so he asks the question that we find in verse 1. Lord, Jehovah. Who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? And I am told that the grammar of these two questions might be better conveyed to our English understanding if we read, Who may abide in thy tabernacle? We're not talking it's about something that is out in the future, something yet to come. Who shall it be? But who may abide in thy tabernacle? Who may dwell in thy holy hill? In looking at various commentators on this question, I find, as often, none more instructive than Charles Haddon Spurgeon in that great three-volume commentary on the book of Psalms that he wrote 
And I want to read to you a little bit of what he sets forward when introducing these questions of this text. Jehovah, thou high and holy one, who shall be permitted to have fellowship with thee? The heavens are not pure in thy sight, and thou chargest thine angels with folly. Who then of mortal mold shall dwell with thee, thou dread consuming fire? A sense of the glory of the Lord and of the holiness which becomes his house, his service, and his attendance excites the humble mind to ask the solemn question before us. Where angels bow with veiled faces, how shall man be able to worship at all? The unthinking may imagine it to be a very easy matter to approach the Most High, and when professedly engaged in his worship, they have no questionings of heart as to their fitness for it. But truly humbled souls often shrink under the sense of utter unworthiness and would not dare to approach the throne of the God of holiness if it were not for him, our Lord, our advocate, who can abide in the heavenly temple because his righteousness endureth forever. Who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall be admitted to be one of the household of God, to sojourn under his roof and enjoy communion with himself? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? The question is raised because it is a question. All men have not this privilege, nay, even among professors. There are aliens from the commonwealth who have no secret intercourse with God. It serves us all to ask the question, who may abide in thy tabernacle? Who may dwell in thy holy hill? For in fact, when we gather together for corporate worship, we are gathering at his tabernacle. His tabernacle is his people. He has tabernacled among us, to use the biblical concept. When we gather together, we come to his holy hill. For as the, whereas the holy hill of Jerusalem, Zion, is where the Ark of the Covenant was, as we assemble, Christ is in our midst, and Christ is our Ark. The Ark of the Covenant was but a picture and a symbol of him. He is the reality of which it was a picture. And who may come into the presence of Christ? Who may appear before God? When we approach the throne of grace in prayer... It is well to ask ourselves this question, Lord, who may abide in thy tabernacle and who may dwell in thy holy hill? What we are speaking about here is the privilege of access unto God. And the psalmist recognizes that access as being a privilege, not a triviality of religious ritual but a profound reality, man meets God. This is an age, most lamentably, that has lost any sense of the profound. There is nothing that is viewed as sacred. Everything is trivialized. Truth is professed by many no longer to exist. You can have your truth, you can have your truth, they can contradict one another, but there is no contradiction, each to his own, 
Who cares? What does it matter? And in such a culture, the profound is utterly lost. And the entire matter of living, in all of the seriousness that attaches to it, and the sobriety with which it should be accomplished, and you know when I say sobriety, I don't mean dullery, for we often emphasize here that there is a joyful sobriety for the people of God in Christ. But sobriety nonetheless, it's gone from our age. Everything has become trivialized. Truth above all else. And one wonders why we have such phenomena as fake news and lying politicians. You see, our entire culture in this land is now built upon one big lie. The lie of biological evolution. Everything is built upon that. The climate crisis scare is simply an outworking of the evolutionary view of the creation. The abortion industry functions on the notion that the unborn is not a creation of God, but we are all simply an evolution of time and matter. An entire culture is built upon a lie. And when an entire culture is built upon a lie, you can expect that truth will be unvalued, utterly trivialized wherever. But that does not change truth, nor remove from the equation of existence the fact that there are those things which are profound. There is God. That is profound. There is a human soul which must live someplace forever. That is profound. There is a heaven and a hell. That is profound. There is eternal unchanging truth that is profound eternal unchanging truth has been embodied in a person that is profound thus the birth of Emmanuel in Bethlehem is a profound reality and his death upon the cross is profound and his perfect righteousness in life and perfect obedience are profound. His resurrection is profound. In other words, the things of God are all profound and therefore the people of God should approach the things of God not in the spirit of triviality that prevails in a God-rejecting culture, but in a spirit of humility that asks the question, Lord, who may abide in thy tabernacle? Who may dwell in thy holy hill? And that spirit is what should animate us in all of our efforts at worship, at all of our approach to the things of God. Our land is deluded and evangelicalism is deluded with the deception that entertainment should be the way to transmit the truth of God. And that people should be attracted to the one who was despised and rejected of men by means of the necessity of recreation. And in all of that is lost the profoundness of the things of God and the spirit that asks the question, Lord, who may abide in thy tabernacle? Who may dwell in thy holy hill? And it is such questions 
that need to be asked of ourselves and to ourselves. And as the psalmist asks this question, God will respond with an answer, but the very asking of the question engenders within the psalmist his own response and answer, which is fact revealed to us as the inerrant word of God. And so what is set forth in this psalm is essentially an answer to the question of whom does God approve? Or to use the image we did this morning from Luke chapter 12, where the rich man was not rich toward God, which we explain means God did not deem him to be rich. Who does God deem to be rich? Who, like the beggar that the angels carried in Abraham's bosom, who is esteemed by God to be rich? The psalm lays forth simply some basic virtues which, if they are not evident in the worshiper, simply expose his worship to be nothing more than empty professionism, hollow religionism. Absent these virtues, Worship simply cannot be genuine worship. Absent these virtues, one does not abide in his tabernacle or stand in his holy hill. It is not at all suggesting that one is saved by the works that he does it is rather expounding that one who is saved does works. That there are those works which make evident the fact that this one has been humbled before God and remains humbled before God and recognizes his total dependence upon the one who is eternal truth. And so the psalmist comes back with ten answers and what I've done in the notes that you receive this evening is simply go through and with a little um, kind of like a footnote at the beginning of each, number those ten so we can follow them through together. And you will see the ten responses to that question, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? And the first of those in verse number two is he that walketh uprightly. Now what we have in fact in Numbers 1, 2, and 3 is a form of speech which speaks not of individual actions but rather of enduring qualities of character. Those who may abide in his tabernacle, who may dwell in his holy hill, those who may acceptably approach unto God are characterized by these three traits of character. They walk uprightly. And thus we've sung this evening the first psalm, which is certainly a wonderful biblical definition of the upright walk. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. There you have the walk of the upright man. He is walking straight. He is standing tall. His life exudes the values of God's kingdom and of God's word. His desire is to walk according to the law of the Lord. He asks the question on every, on every move, what saith the scripture? 
and then proceeds with the answer, this I will do. His walk is upright. He isn't looking to the latest fad of the age to form his way of living. He isn't considering the contemporary wisdom of the talking heads on television as that which will dictate his action. No. He says, let God be true and every man a liar. He turns from the ways of man unto the ways of God and in those paths, often lonely, many times rocky, sometimes uphill and strenuous, and always against the current, he walks. He walketh uprightly. That's his nature. That's his character. And such as walk in that manner are such as stand before God and worship. Genuine worship. Not only does he walk uprightly, but the second of the ten items is that he worketh righteousness. In other words, he is a doer of the word and not a hearer only. He is concerned that what he does is righteous and concerned that what he does serves the purpose of righteousness. <coughs> Excuse me. He employs himself diligently and firmly in the cause of godliness. When he hears of the work of God underway, his thought is, what can I do to advance and to support it? When he hears of a specific need for which he has a set of skills, he steps forward. Let me serve the Lord with what I possess, with what I have, with the meager means that God has given me. He recognizes that his purpose on life is not to build an estate for himself, not to gain a reputation for himself, but his entire purpose is to set forth the kingdom of God, both in his attitude, his actions, his administration of his personal affairs, his handling of his finances, his communications with others. He says with the Apostle Paul, for to me to live is Christ. He worketh righteousness. And the third trait of such a man is he speaketh the truth in his heart. In his heart. You see, <clears throat> true saints of God desire truth within. Truth is not a means for them to achieve their ends. Something they will withhold falsely if they think the divulging of it will not be to their gain. They recognize instead that there is a value to truth that transcends their own experience, their own comfort, their own ease. Admittedly, from the scripture, the ways of truth are not always the easiest ways. Often, they are the more difficult ways. Yea, in a sin-cursed world where the entire system is set against the God of truth, maintaining truth will be a rigorous undertaking. But in their heart, it's already set. Truth. I shall stand with the truth. I shall stand for the truth. If I must stand alone to do so, the decision is already made in advance. I am a truther. I will love the truth. I will indeed live the truth. He speaketh truth in his heart. 
such a person scorns double meanings, evasions, equivocations, the little lies of convenience. They treasure truth. Their heartbeat is the throb of truth. For they recognize that truth is not simply some intellectual abstraction. Truth is a person. And that person is Christ, who said to his disciples, I am the way, the truth, and the life. When speaking on this matter to our students in the school and chapel, I will at times resort to the illustration of a student taking a baseball bat and going to Mr. Wilson's vehicle and breaking out the headlights and then to the windshield and breaking out the windshield. And when they do so, they have not laid a hand on Mr. Wilson but they have violated him and showed dishonor to him because his property is an extension of his person. All truth is God's truth. It is true and unchanging truth because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. To tell a lie is not simply to deceive another person and show utmost disrespect for that person. To tell a lie is to show disrespect for God, who is the guardian of truth. All truth is his. And those who have this in their heart concerning truth, they speak the truth in their heart. Therein manifest a trait of character which is a descriptor of those who appear before God, who abide in his tabernacle, who dwell in his holy place. Now from these three character traits, the psalmist now goes to specific actions and deals with with another seven specific actions which are actions wrought by those whose worship is true, those who may abide in his holy place. And so we see in verse number three, the fourth item that he names, he that backbiteth not with his tongue backbiting. That is not a word we use, is it, in our usual conversation? But what a good word it is, backbiting. We all know the expression, don't bite the hand that feeds you, one that is spoken, I guess, out of the context of hungry dogs who quickly bite the person who's feeding them. We understand what that means, and that's a kind of backbiting. But this backbiting is that which does not regard the dignity or the worthiness of others. A backbiter, by his very action, is elevating himself above those against whom he does the backbiting. And one has written, that some men's tongues bite more than their teeth. Backbiting. You smile to one's face and greet him well, but as soon as his back is turned, the same tongue that has spewed forth blessing spews forth cursing and speaks evil of him ill of him to the person standing there. We call it being two-faced. A person who is two-faced 
therein endeavors to serve two masters. But no man can serve two masters, our Lord tells us. And the backbiter will not appear on the holy hill of the Lord, does not stand in his holy place. Backbiting, coming back at a person behind their back with an evil and an ill report. And so that leads into the fifth item that is named, nor doth evil to his neighbor. You see, backbiting will come to slander at the least, if not out-and-out manufactured lies. The slander, the words spoken against a neighbor. How much of what is said really needs to be said? I preach to myself. If we spoke only that which needs to be said, we would never slander, we would never backtalk or backbite, and we would probably spend considerable time in silence, which isn't a bad idea. Those who will appear before God as the true worshipers of God those who will stand in his holy place will not be gossips against their neighbor. And when it speaks of the neighbor, it's not simply talking about the person who lives next door or down the street. It's talking about your fellow man. Words against another. Slander. This is a matter where we need to check ourselves often. For words are merely the expressors of attitudes, and attitudes quickly turn because pride has been hurt, because envy has set in. What a monster of destruction jealousy is, and how it manifests itself in the words, doeth evil to his neighbor, Evil actions begin with evil thoughts in the heart. And between the action and the thought, there come the evil words. Unbecoming the people of God, not to be found among those who will abide in his tabernacle, who will dwell in his holy place. The sixth item that he names nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. Now, if the fifth, doing evil to the neighbor, involves slander, then the sixth, taking up a reproach against a neighbor, involves receiving that slander. Or as one put it, the tale-bearer carrieth the devil in his tongue, and the tale-hearer carries the devil in his ear. The willingness to receive an evil report. And oh, one must be vigilant to halt them from coming. But when one comes with what early appears to be slander against another, having the fortitude and the honesty to say, I don't want to hear it. Do not speak it to me is something that should certainly characterize the people of God. Let me hear only truth. There are enough deceptions already lodged in the human heart. I needn't have others suggested to it. Let me simply hear the truth. And if it is not true, if you are not sure that it's true, then why are you saying it? to defile another's ear and mind and heart with yet another morsel of error. He will not hear slander. If those who hear slander were vigilant to stop it in its tracks, 
those who spread slander would be much less famed, their slander greatly diminished. But you see, one who will hear slander is doubtless more disposed to transmit it to yet another. And rumors, gossip, can spread around the world before truth can even get its boots on. And this is the case lamentably among many who would profess to know our Lord. Who may abide in thy tabernacle? Who may dwell in thy holy hill? This question should continually hammer at our thought and our conscience that we not be engaged with the tongue in backbiting and the slander that is a part of that backbiting and the hearing of slander, which is a participation in the lie and the sin. And then we come to verse number four, where a seventh trait is given (coughs) of those who abide in his tabernacle and dwell in his holy hill, in whose eyes a vile person is contemned, condemned. We touched on this briefly this morning. This means that one will not commend or esteem the wicked. He will not advance, praise, commend, or esteem those whose ways are vile, those whose ways are set against God. This is why I struggle to fathom how a Christian professor can go and pay money to watch and hear a Hollywood star who has become their favorite. Can pay money to attend a concert where the heroes of the night are the most ungodly cultural icons among us. To do such is to love this world and the things that are in the world of which we are told love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if many men love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And this 15th Psalm is setting forth the same thing when it says that those who are the true worshipers of God, those who appear before his tabernacle, those who stand in his holy place, they are those who in whose eyes a vile person is contemned, not commended, not funded, not praised, not applauded, not beloved. They look at the wickedness of the world and they call it what it is, wickedness. It is set against God. Am I to applaud God's enemies? Am I to love them with such a love that I will pay my money to see them and adore them? No man can serve two masters. Either he will love the one and hate the other, or he will despise the one and cling to the other. This calls for believers to truly be separated from the sin-loving, sin-praising sin-inventing world. We needn't look to them as icons for attention. We already have enough iniquity in our own hearts naturally that it needn't any additions from outside. We must call sin what it is. We must look at evil and say, it is evil. Don't try to convince me 
there is some good in it or some redeeming feature to it. Love not the world in whose eyes a vile person is contempt. But, number seven continues, he honoreth them that fear the Lord. And how many times in my life, in fact, most of the time in my life, those who excluded the first half of this seventh command in whose eyes a vile person is condemned also transgressed the second half. Those who feared God were just too religious. What, do you mean I'm supposed to be like the Amish? Is the kind of response that they give when one speaks of living a pure separated life. And those who live in the fear of God, they do not desire in their company. They want to avoid them. But why? We are justified to ask. Might one contemplate dwelling in God's presence and in his holy hill who doesn't have a regard for God-fearing people. If you have no desire for God-fearing people on this earth, if they are to be laughed at, if they are to be quietly scorned, if they are to be set aside in thought as just being, you know, just too, too over the top in religion, what then do you think of God? And do you have any desire really to be with God? None would acknowledge, I don't want to be with God. Yet how many of them who would never acknowledge that live in such a way that says, I don't want to be with God's people. They're just too holy. Those who will appear before God, those who abide in his tabernacle and dwell in his holy hill, they condemn sin. And they don't admire or esteem or applaud or pay wicked people for their wickedness. But they do fear God. And they see those who live in the fear of God as the ones who should be and will be their greatest friends in life. Their true colleagues and comrades. And then to verse 4, an eighth quality of those who will dwell in his holy hill and abide in his tabernacle. A quality that really is searching and revealing of the heart. He that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. He makes a deal. And he gives his word. But between the time that he has given his word and the transaction is to be enacted, suddenly something enters that interrupts his thinking on the matter. That might not be in my best interest. Forget my word, I'm backing out. He has affirmed that which he finds is to his own heart, and he changes. He goes back on his word. He fails to live out the principle that a deal is a deal. He goes back on his word and thus transgresses this revealing element of the spirit of the heart. 
those who may abide in thy tabernacle and who may dwell in thy holy place, when they have given their word and then find that to keep it will not be in their best interest, they will keep their word. Because truth, remember, is the highest value. Truth is of greater value than my own prosperity in earthly things because truth is eternally attached to God and God is of greatest value. And therefore, when I give my word, my word must be kept to the very best of my ability. He sweareth to his own heart and changeth not. And then there is a ninth trait of these. Verse five, he that putteth not out his money to usury. He's speaking here of charging interest. And this understand is in that Old Testament context in which One who borrowed money, no doubt borrowed it, not for a business venture, but because they were in debt and needed to pay that debt. Because they didn't have enough money to make ends meet, they could not provide for themselves and therefore needed the help of their brethren and to give them money on the condition that they pay it back plus some, only adds to their affliction, only adds to their debt, and is unconscionable. And it is against that practice that the Old Testament speaks in condemning usury. And so we hear Christ speaking against the scribes and the Pharisees, who in fact would abuse widows, with such thieving means. It is not speaking about you loaning someone money in order that with that money they might go into a venture where they earn more money themselves. It is entirely biblically justified in those cases where you have loaned them money for you to also be a partaker of their profit and to be paid interest out of what profit they have gained from your money. And so if they can take your money and put it to work in some industry of their own and increase it by 100%, it's entirely acceptable that you get 5% of that or, or, or more. Those, that's not what it's speaking about. Christ in his own ministry commended the proper investment of means. But this speaks about taking advantage of those who have nothing by loaning on interest to them rather than simply giving them the money if you can or giving it to them to use free of charge until they can repay it. Those who will stand in the holy place, those who will appear before God in acceptable worship do not put out their money to such usury. And then a tenth characteristic at the end of verse 5, <coughs> nor taketh reward against the innocent. This speaks of bribery. There is a trial underway. The accused is innocent. The guilty person has not been apprehended. But the guilty person, crooked as he is, or perhaps his family that knows of his guilt but refuses to admit it, or maybe some friends and cronies of his who are aware of his guilt but are going to watch out for their friend, they come to the judge and they pay the judge. You find this man guilty, the innocent man guilty, and we will pay you this much. You have everything to gain by finding him guilty. 
And so the judge accepts the bribe and the innocent is condemned. Bribery, paying bribes, dishonest. God's people do not function that way. Those who will stand in the hill of the Lord, those who will abide in his holy place, neither put out their money to usury to abuse the poor and needy, nor put out their money to pay a bribe in order to condemn the innocent. And we read in the fifth verse, the last phrase, he that doeth these things shall never be moved. Unmovable is the person who does these things, for God has planted him upon the rock. Now let us notice two things in closing. <coughs> First of all, the third item, he speaketh the truth in his heart, is in fact included in all the other nine items. For each of the other nine, walking uprightly, working righteousness, not backbiting with the tongue, no slander against a neighbor, no hearing of slander, no praising an unpraiseworthy vile person, honoring those who fear the go God, no changing when you've sworn to your own hurt. All of these things involve the truth. Every one of them is simply another slice of the whole matter of truthfulness. And we come back again to what I've already emphasized, that the whole matter rests upon valuing the truth. Each of the ten, though speaking of different matters, comes back on that foundation. Truth. God's people value truth truth. And the fact that truth is at the very heart of the people of God throughout history is doubtless one of the reasons why the world is so against it. And Satan began his crusade against mankind with the question, hath God said and questioned truth? And with that, remember that truth is an extension of God himself. And to violate truth is to assault the one who is truth. The second observation in concluding. <coughs> Which of you is or has been characterized by these ten qualities. I see no hands going up. I didn't expect to see any hands. No disrespect to you, but the acknowledgement that we have all sinned. And it brings us to this reality. There is only one person who has ever lived who meets these ten qualifications. And that is Christ, who is the truth. He alone has met them all and graciously imputes to those who believe him all of his righteousness so that the people of God are received on Christ's behalf in the hill of the Lord to stand in his holy place. We come by Christ alone. And let us recognize with that that the one item we cite here which is most revealing of the inner heart, he that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not, is exactly what Christ did. 
when he came to give himself a ransom for many, it was the worst deal in all of human transactions. The just dies for the unjust. The master suffers for the deeds of his servant. The Savior crucified for those he comes to save. In all of human history, there has never been a greater loss to an individual than when the Son of God, Emmanuel, God incarnate, laid down his life upon the cross in order to keep the everlasting covenant. But this is what he did. And he didn't change. Consequently, we can read from the scripture and affirm with thanksgiving Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. On my behalf, he entered into a transaction in which he would do all of the paying and I would do all of the receiving and I would fight against the very gift that he provided for me to receive. And he would move to overcome my rebellion and conquer and subdue my heart with sovereign love that I may receive the gift of eternal life. Psalm 15 is ultimately a beautiful portrait of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us see him in this psalm. Let us see him as the one who may and does stand in the tabernacle and abide in the holy place. And let us abide in him and know our abiding in him through prayer and supplication with him. For such in Christ abide in the holy place. And let us pray and live so as to actuate each of these ten in our own living every day. May God help us. Shall we pray? Almighty God and gracious Father in heaven, we thank thee that where we have sinned and gone astray and transgressed all of your commandments and all of the markers of those who are received at thy holy place, that we have in thy dear Son one who has fulfilled them all <coughs> as full, <coughs> full as they can be fulfilled, and who imputes to us that very righteousness. May we see in him our all in all. May we see in him the very fullness of the Godhead bodily. May we see in him the one who is the head of all principality and power and the one in whom we are complete. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.